Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're going to try to get started. Um, so I'd invite you, if you'd like anything else from the buffet table, here's a few nice desserts over there, or coffee or tea, please help yourselves. Um, my name is Lisa Cardi, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here today to CSIS and to the Global Health Policy Center. It's a great honor to have with us this afternoon the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, His Excellency Jonas Stor, as well as Ambassador Vegar Stoman and the rest of the Norwegian delegation. Uh, Mr. Minister, I bring particular greetings from John Hamre, uh, the President of CSIS, who's very sorry that he can't be here with us today. Uh, John's traveling overseas, but um, he's a great admirer of your work and deeply appreciative of your visit here with us. Uh, at CSIS, we like to describe the Global Health Policy Center as the bridge between foreign policy and global health. In fact, the contributions of Norway and Minister Storr, your own personal leadership in this area, long before it was a recognized field, have clearly demonstrated the importance of linking global health and foreign policy and the critical advances that can be made in both fields when they work together. I think everyone here knows that Norway has long been visionary in helping set the global health agenda. From its early support for the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization and the Global Fund, to its ongoing leadership around the MDGs and the 0.7 commitment to overseas development assistance, to the minister's own direct engagement in launching the Foreign Policy and Global Health Initiative with six other foreign ministers, an initiative I think that for the first time this fall will result in a report to the UN General Assembly by the Secretary General of the importance of health and foreign policy. Uh, Minister Storr has been deeply engaged in all of these processes for more than two decades. First as Director General of the International Department in the Prime Minister's Office, then as Ambassador to the UN organiza Organizations in Geneva, followed by an assignment as, ch as Chief of Staff to WHO Director General Bro Grundtland, a period as Secretary General of the Norwegian Red Cross, and then Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Stoltenberg. Mr. Minister, thank you for bringing your wealth of experience to CSIS today and for sparing us some time in your busy schedule. We have an audience that's very anxious to hear about Norway's experiences and to hear how you think the U.S. should be um, looking ahead to the critical challenges of the future. Thanks. <coughs> Minister Storr. <Sure. coughs> thank you for those nice words. And Happy birthday. This, if this is World Health Day. You all knew, of course. Yeah. Yes. And I recall from my days at, at WHO that that was a day we should be have respect for. So that being said, it's a special pleasure to be here. Send my regards back to John Hamry. And we have a uh, Norwegian government, a lot of contact with this fine house and fine center. And I appreciate that I had this opportunity to come and talk to you. And I, you know, when I am invited to talk about this issue, I always start by saying that it is a fair question, although I see friends around here who would have an idea of the answer. Uh, why invite a foreign minister to speak on health? What does he know about medicine, health systems, health budgets, hospitals, mental health and other diseases? The answer, to be honest, is little. And certainly far less than any health minister and hopefully far less than many of you. But here is the point. When I had the privilege of serving the World Health Organization with Dr. Brundtland from 1998, I had the opportunity to discover how much more there is to health, uh, the global health than the strict medical side of the issue. I did so by seeing, listening, and working with some extraordinary people from the global health community from around the world, and there are some of them here today who I remember as good friends and very inspirational people for me. I learned from them a few very important lessons, and I'd like to share a few with you. I learned that health is more than a budget expenditure. It is an investment in human dignity, human development, and thus in economic development and welfare of people, communities, and nations needs to be said, I believe. I learned that investing wisely in health was a powerful tool to the fight against extreme poverty. Poor health breeds poverty, that we have known, but we now know much better how improved health breeds growth 
and development, the equation works both ways, offering us a powerful opportunity to both fight poverty and stimulate development. Finance ministers need to know. My own as well. I learned more about the amazing work that is carried out by health workers all around the world, from modern and sophisticated clinics in both Oslo and Geneva, where my wife has given birth to our children, to the local facility in an Indian village where a brave midwife helps a mother to save both her newborn baby's life and her own life, because she gives birth there and not on the floor at home at her mother's-in-law's house. I learned about how much more we could accomplish by working differently, by reaching out to other partners beyond health, by assembling the evidence necessary for Dr. Brundtland to call presidents, prime ministers, finance ministers, and tell them, you too are health ministers. Your decisions matter to health, get to work and get engaged. I learned about the opportunities and complexities of these new partnerships, about the new financial resources we could mobilize through creations such as Gavi uh, uh, and the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB and malaria, but also about the very complex landscape that we are about to create with private public interactions and sometimes a lack of overview and unity of purpose. The price we are paying by seeing the UN relatively go down. Being a foreign policy man myself, I learned how much global health matters to foreign policy and security policy. How health holds perhaps the strongest stories of globalization. Talking to young people of all ages, you can use health as the lens to explain what globalization is really about. How an outbreak of a pandemic immediately will challenge our diplomatic and security systems. How modern states might be brought to closing borders. Norway closed its border with Sweden in 2000 because of the outbreak of food and mouth disease in Britain. And I remember I advised the Minister of the Agriculture at the time that closing a border is relatively easy. Opening it again is much harder. How the ownership of a virus quickly becomes a diplomatic struggle between the North and the South. Patents, how a polio immunization campaign can offer the opportunity of a truce and perhaps by the f be the first step towards peace and the peace process. And finally, I learned about what it takes to make a difference in health. I remember at PAHO in 1998, Bill Feige told this masterfully when he described all the efforts that would have to fall into place to immunize a child. From the initial research in some laboratory, through testing, production, transport, establishment of the cold chain in some tropical country, and the training of the nurse at the local health station with the injection and the clean and safe needle. All of this and much more in a long row until that lucky child would be protected for life against fully preventable diseases. Dr. Feige drew on that saying, Ambassador from Tanzania, which also became the title of Secretary Clinton's book some 10 years ago, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. And Dr. Feggy elaborated on that title beautifully by saying it takes a whole world to immunize a child. So this is me, a foreign minister who had the privilege to discover the world of global health and with the ambition of continuing to deal with it as an interested person but also as a foreign minister with other challenges and in settings not always accustomed to these issues. And in this context, let me add another thing that I learned and still learn the importance that professions break out of their boxes and dramatically improve their interaction. Health professionals in particular, who are boxed in, if I may say so. A famous Norwegian public health official, Mr. Carl Evang, who took part in the drafting of the constitution of the WHO back in 1948, he said that to him economists were worse than TB. <laughs> now in these days of financial crisis he may have had a point actually. <laughs> But another point far more relevant, I believe, is that the health profession and the economic profession can now do a lot by maximizing their efforts and working together, as we see they do. I believe we made a contribution to this with the report of the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health in 2000-2001 that highlighted the potential of investing wisely and strategically in health as a strategy to fight extreme poverty. 
So in short, global health is more than an issue. It has to do with managing complex international relations, important principles and major challenges of inequality and injustice. It involves changing financial priorities and establishing organizations and working relationships. In short, we must reach beyond our grasp to fulfill our task. So what is the Norwegian approach to this? Health has always been a major issue in our development policy. Since 2000, we have scaled up. We have been focusing on taking the lead in three concrete initiatives. First, Gavi, and I, I recall this story uh, when uh, Jens Stoltenberg became Prime Minister in March 2000. I came home from WHO as his Chief of Staff, and he had read about Gavi and, and the immunization efforts. Tore Godal and I had written articles about that in Norwegian papers. So he put into his government platform the short document to Parliament, in addition to all the infrastructure and hospitals and budgets and pensions, one line. Norway will take the lead in helping immunizing every child. Very strange sentence in the government statement. It wasn't really debated in Parliament, but it was the ambition. So we were the first government to pledge to the partnership of Gavi, and we have remained commit committed since. Uh, and you know, of course, about uh, uh, what Gavi has done and how it is organized and, 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 and its, its, its ambition. I believe the results have been impressive. WHO estimates that between 2000 and 2008, some 3.4 million future deaths have been prevented through immunization campaigns supported by Gavi. That is the equivalent of the number of inhabitants in Chicago and Washington DC combined. And I use these figures when I speak to young people in Norway, because there was, in addition to me coming from Geneva, there was one person who really convinced the prime ministers to put this into his Parliament speech, and that was the head of the Social Democratic Youth. And I'm using this argument to say that, you know, it matters to engage in politics. You can achieve great results. And, and this young youth leader, she is now a member of the cabinet, but at that time she was an activist, and it led to the government investing billions over the years for Gavi. And when I say that, you know, 3.4 million future deaths have been prevented, I say that she can probably not claim honor for all of those, but in a way she can. Because in a world where young people are cynical, saying, you know, nothing works, can we make a difference? Here is an example. It really can matter. Successful, but we must not be complacent. We must constantly look for improvements, be accountable and transparent and ready to adjust as we go forward, especially in these new initiatives. Second, Norway has been actively engaged with the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. I remember Jim Sherry and I went to Brussels on complex meetings uh, in the setting up of that uh, institution. So the Global Fund uh, is also a creative mix of governments, private sector actors, support from WHO, UNAIDS and the World Bank. We have seen huge boost in treatment, counseling and prevention of HIV AIDS distribution of 70 million bed nets, the most cost-effective measure we have for preventing malaria, as well as delivery of 74 million malaria treatments and detection and treatment of 4.6 million additional cases of infectious tuberculosis. Today, we stand on the threshold of a real breakthrough in the battle against malaria. There are people working hard for that here in this room, for so long at the core of global health efforts and frustrations. And third, if I were to mention on methodology, we have pushed for more results-based management in the way we do global health. Global health issues cut across traditional organizational structures in international affairs and should be addressed accordingly. UNAIDS was set up to work primarily through its sponsoring organizations in the UN system, while also forming partnerships with a broad range of NGOs, governments and other actors. Rollback Malaria, Stop TB, are other partnerships that were formed, anchored in WHO, reaching out. So I repeat here, accountability and transparency is key, and both may become harder with this new complex landscape. In order to keep the trust of both taxpayers and private investors, we must constantly work on our methods on how we spend and invest and monitor and report. And if we were to add to this, this long list, and I know as we discussed over lunch that many of these achievements are right now as we speak being, speak being challenged because of the financial crisis, money going down, burden on poor people going up. 
and we will see dramatic figures. But if we look at the last decade, we see some extraordinary results. It's worth reminding about them. More than 200 million children have been vaccinated in low-income countries by vaccines previously not available. And the old rule of thumb, I believe it was, that 10% of them would die if they were not immunized. So by immunizing 200 million, we, we, get, we get close to that 3.4 million lives saved. Deaths from measles dropped by over 90% in sub-Saharan Africa, major achievement. More than 100 million bed nets have been distributed in South Saharan Africa. It can be expected that malaria mortality can be rolled back by more than 90% in the coming years. We can fail, but we can also succeed. Treatment costs for AIDS reduced from more than $30 to less than one. More than three million people are on treatment as we speak. That's impressive, but far too little. As I think Jim would, would say, if, if, if he's the same man that I knew a few years ago. In short, uh, these are telling figures. Gavi and the Global Fund alone may have saved six million lives based on an investment of some nine billion dollars. Six million lives by nine billion dollars. I think it is, it, is a, it is a reasonable return on investment. Then some have asked, isn't there a risk that we could lose coherence in our effort to promote global health if we concentrate on just a few diseases at a time? And don't we rise, risk to lose overview by having all of these complex partnerships operating together with nobody keeping an overall coordinating function? And this touches on my real responsibility as a foreign minister, responsible for support to the UN and to the established international system. I believe this is a very valid point. And there should be no, and there should be no, um, um, uh, not, it should not be our ambition to cut those answers or to cut that debate short. It is a debate on the matrix of horizontal versus vertical intervention, and it is a debate on the governance of global health now that voluntary contributions outstrips the regular budget of WHO. I remember at my time at WHO, and Ambassador Moose, I think that was just when you were there. The voluntary contribution kept coming up, and right when I was there, it cut to 50%. So m the majority of WHO spending came from voluntary sources, governments mainly, and the rest, the other 50% from the, the regular fees, so to say. Norway was a case in point, because Norway is a small country, so our, our fee was small, but our voluntary contribution was high. Today I learn it is 80-20. And that is, you know, in a way a good news because WHO's budgets has, I learned, in fact, increased. So Dr. Brundtland and Dr. Lee and Dr. Chan have been able to convince governments very hard not to have zero uh, level, but to have a slight increase because the health tasks are daunting. But even with an increase in the regular budget, it is 80% voluntary, 20% regular. So it shows something about the volume, but it also tells us something about the governing bodies of WHO having influence basically only over 20% of what the organization does. I think it is a huge challenge to the international system. We need to discuss it because the alternative is not to roll back. The alternative is to innovate the way we run this landscape. Norway's cons consistent approach as we support new partnerships because there is no alternative. And we fought in 1998, and Jim will remember, the nostalgic view inside WHO saying that it says in our constitution, and Joy, you came when, when this all started to change, it says in our constitution that we are the lead agency in health. So why should we engage? Why should we engage with Gavi when we can do immunization ourselves? Why should we even accept UN AIDS when we can do AIDS ourselves? And I think that is one of the achievements of Dr. Brunton actually, that she, she forced that through. There is no alternative if you want to mobilize resources, competence, skills, and engagement. But we have had a consistent approach to keep focusing on the need to strengthen the UN and the WHO and UNICEF, and to keep a strong WHO at the core as a standard-setting and normative agency, respected. And I, I think Dr. Chan is doing a good job about that these days, although it is, it, it is a hard, hard job. Let me then move on to the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and make a few reflections on our progress. Norway has kept the MDGs as the guiding principles for our development cooperation. And let me say that our development cooperation with this government and the same government program we adopted in 2005 now has reached 1% of GDP. It was the goal we set 
and we have been gradually climbing, and for this year, for the first time, we have reached 1%. Three of the MDGs are on health, and there is where we have tried to maximize our contribution. Important progress has been made on MDG 6, on halting and reversing the spread of HIV AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, and making effective treatment available. The US engagement under President Bush has been essential for success so far, and will be equally essential in future efforts. There has been some success on MDG 4 on reducing the mortality rate of children under the age of 5, primarily due to the immunization campaigns. But the drama still unfolds. Far too many children still die of causes that are easy to prevent. This is not high-tech, it is low-tech, and it's a challenge of really distribution uh, and logistics. As a contrast to these relative success stories, or at least progress, we have failed miserably on MDG 5 reducing maternal and infant mortality. The goal set in 2000 was to reduce maternal mortality by three quarters by 2015 and making reproductive health accessible to all. Today, one mother and eight newborn babies die every minute. Hardly any different to the situation 10 years ago. It is a, it is a terrible figure. It is still the case that the first day and hour in the baby's life is the most dangerous one. And for millions of women, nothing can be more dangerous than giving birth. On reproductive health, there has been some progress on the availability of prenatal care, but the huge unmet needs for family planning undermines other goals. So what are the main reasons? It boils down to the discrimination against women and their nutritional, social and economic needs and rights, and the lack of available and reliable quality health services. And on these factors, of course, women will be extremely vulnerable now with the economic crisis hitting. And even where health services do exist, they tend to be poorly adapted to women's needs and out of reach in practical terms. We have worked to find some practical ways of addressing these issues, reaching the pregnant woman, following her through the, her pregnancy with enough assistance to make it safely to deliver. It need not be too complicated. In India, together with the government of India and selected local governments, we have focused on the need to get the pregnant woman to deliver in a health facility and not on some dirty floor. That simple, the method has been to make available a small financial incentive to the woman, in short, paying her to choose the health clinic over the family, which is in itself maybe a liberating uh, activity. And I said mother-in-law because in some of these special district, that, that really has been uh, the challenge. Not a small burden to overcome in many settings. We do these programs in Pakistan, India, Tanzania and Nigeria. We have established a partnership to promote maternal health. What we have seen is a tenfold increase in the number of poor women delivering their babies in health facilities, from less than a million to 10 million achieved in just four years. This is India, though that district, simply by paying for them to do so. And consequently, we have seen a dramatic drop in both babies and mothers dying. This was one concrete example. What should then be the way forward? Promoting effective and viable health systems is key. We all know that and we all know how complex it is. We must provide accessible primary health care services, educated health workers, available and affordable medicines and diagnostic services and a governance structure that is efficient and reliable. This is not news to you. It is not rocket science either. To reach the MDG goals by 2015, we will need to do even more for women and children, invest more and more work smarter and more strategically together. I am pleased to see the new US administration give high priority to maternal and child health. And I was pleased yesterday in my one hour meeting with the secretary that we spent a lot of time on this. And I could really see her geared up and motivated and stimulated about it. One example, Norway and the US will now both be candidates for the UN Human Rights Council. There's a lot to be said about that council. It's better than the Commission, but it is not good enough. But I think that Norway and the US and Belgium will be three countries joining on that Western ticket. We will already now start preparing to work closely together on human rights as we know them, but also on these issues, because they need to be brought on, on, on for it. They are more important than statements on defamation of religion that we see this body now, now dealing with. 
and the secretary was geared up for that, so I'm happy to, to see that. One major challenge is money, especially now that we are in the midst of the financial crisis. Aid budgets, private budgets, for those purposes, they will go down for certain, although it is highly regrettable. We need to protect the health sector to the maximum. In Europe, work is, uh, is in progress to identify innovative finance mechanisms to help reach these goals. We need to develop new opportunities and take these initiatives further. Promising work is on the way. Unit aid brings in additional millions by a modest tax on air tickets. We support new initiatives that would stimulate other innovative financial mechanisms from governments to individuals. In addition, as I started, we should also see foreign policy in a broader sense through a health lens. I learned this at WHO all about all the links between foreign policy, trade policy and health. And as you mentioned, in 2006 I invited six other foreign ministers from Brazil, France, Indonesia, Senegal, South Africa and Thailand to join me in declaring that global health was, quote, a pressing foreign policy issue of our times. Some of those ministers have changed in between. But it didn't hurt to get Bernard Kushner. And the one I launched it with, Dos de Blasi, is now the UN Secretary General's Special Representative on Innovative Finance Mechanisms, geared up on this. So health does more to people, you know, when they get into foreign policy, they tend to stick to it. In March 2007, we adopted the Oslo Declaration that states that investment in health is fundamental to economic growth and development. Threats to health might compromise a country's stability and security. Building capacity for global health, security, facing threats, threats to global health and making globalization work for all, all depend on conscious use of foreign policy instruments and on political will. And I think a similar point was made by then Senator Barack Obama when he reflected on American national interest in global engagement. This was back in April 2007, and I quote, since extremely poor societies and weak states provide optimal breeding ground for disease, terrorism and conflict, the United States has a direct national security interest in dramatically reducing global poverty and joining with our allies in sharing more of our riches to help those most in need. I agree. Encouraged to see this policy put out in practice in the budget proposal from the US State Department in which global health is a priority area and encouraged by the potential for taking this forward after my meeting with Hillary Clinton yesterday. The Foreign Policy and Global Health Initiative, as I mentioned, is all about engagement and outreach, building political alliances among states with different outlooks in different regions. And that's why Indonesia, South Africa and Brazil are important. Um, different priorities and different ge geographic affiliations, but with a strong and consistent political will to promote global health as a common cause. Our method of work is not to form a separate organization or a fixed structure. We meet from time to time as ministers and our experts meet regularly to address new issues. So these are some of my reflections. I, I have this fam famous quote that health is simply too important to be left to health ministers alone. I say that to my health minister colleague, you know, to keep him geared up. This is not to underestimate health ministers, of course, but to highlight that finance ministers, prime ministers, presidents, and foreign, min foreign ministers are needed as well. They cannot point to the health minister and say, this is your business, because so much of what we do is also part of that bigger health landscape. So thank you for listening, and thank you for engaging in this, and I'd like to applaud uh, the CISS for really putting this program, uh, this new program, about smart interventions, is that what you call it? Smart? Smart global health policy. Yeah, exactly. I would like to be part of that. Thank you. Uh, I'm inspired. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Minister. That, that was, for me, truly inspiring, but also a very pragmatic way of thinking about this very complex world. Um, and I have at least three or four questions I could put to the minister, but I'm going to have to a exercise some self-restraint here because our time is limited. I think you probably have about maybe 10 minutes or so for um, questions. So 15, wonderful. So we will um, take them maybe in groups of three. Um, I'd ask you please to identify yourself um, first. If that groups of three is that? Excellent, okay. excellent. Okay. So any questions at this point that folks would like to put forward? Mm -hmm. 
my name is Joy. I, I wanted to, first of all, thank the, the minister for, for this um, very, very, um, not, not fresh because it's not new, but uh, very, very uh, forward-looking because he has taken a new concept and really pushed it, I think, to the limits, particularly uh, during this time when we need uh, real uh, dedicated leadership to keep us on track in the health sector. I, we have been working with the other, I work for the World Bank. We have been working with the uh, PEPFA, UNAIDS, um, the Global Fund, WHO, etc., to, to see, to, to assess the impact of this crisis on the HIV AIDS treatment and prevention and care programs in countries. What we are finding is that because of the budget cuts uh, to ministers of health, um, they are not, a lot of countries are not able to continue to enroll new patients into their HIV AIDS treatment programs. Um, and we have had very, very, um, you know, uh, I mean, alarming copy mechanisms. Some patients are sharing tablets. Uh, some, pa some mothers are refusing to continue treatment if their husbands and children cannot assess the treatment. So we are, we are really having a huge crisis which has the potential of, of uh, having a resistance building to the first uh, line of treatment, and uh, which is therefore going to wipe access to first line treatment at a time when second line treatment is totally uh, uh, unaffordable for developing countries. Now, I was very interested when you talked, I mean, this is something that I'm familiar with about the conditional cash transfers in in, that are enabling access in India and uh, in some other countries which your country is helping uh, to finance. Um, do you think that there's a possibility to restructure temporarily the financing of uh, uh, the Global Fund and Gavi to be able, using mechanisms such as that, to be able to meet this new threat uh, to global health that uh, has the potential of uh, totally disrupting uh, the, the health systems and uh, reversing the gains that we've made in the recent past. Thanks for that question. Um, second question? Sir, how are you? I'm Tom Coulson, I'm the Deputy Surgeon General of the Navy. Uh, our, <coughs> our Navy and our other military uh, forces in the United States have been carrying out health diplomacy and uh, humanitarian assistance throughout the world, sometimes in a very visible way as when our ships go to the Pacific into South America and other, and other times in uh, more uh, smaller associations with other countries. I was wondering, uh, you, you mentioned health as a security issue, and I was wondering about your opinions uh, when military forces carry out uh, humanitarian assistance missions such as we're doing. And a question in the back, Peter. I'm Judith Kaufman, an independent consultant, formerly of the State Department and WHO. Um, when we talk about health diplomacy, a lot of what people talk about is that providing health programs, doing health programs, helps generally in security and foreign policy. I'm curious about the way you and your foreign, your fellow foreign ministers have conceived of ways that foreign policy can <coughs> help support global health and the role for diplomacy in global health. Thanks. Well, first to Joy, I mean, I, I, I think what you point to there is very scary because what we actually see is that there are very hard-won gains that are extremely vulnerable and fragile. And when, when we have this, this dip that we have now, um, it, it is not simply that they will be out of, of um, function for some months and then come back hopefully when things uh, turn something will be destroyed which cannot be put easily together um, whether you know this kind of approach that, 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 that I illustrated here with the Indian example can be used with the global fund on Gavi I don't know I remember the World Bank I think it was in 2003 the World Development Report had a lot of reflections on these financial incentives uh, which are very, very minor and, and, and be becomes, you know, for a Norwegian, if you, if you keep a Norwegian perspective, something very questionable because our approach will be the universal rights. 
you, you don't pay somebody that will take the money and go and buy the service. The government will secure the service by universal care and it's your right. And I remember I, I was advising that report and I was brought that perspective into the debate because I felt it, that it was lacking. But I think it is a very important point that that report raised. Because here what you do with that woman who gets that small incentive where you actually pay her to go and give birth in the clinic is something different because universal care cannot be even envisaged under those circumstances. I think still is an interesting approach. And as I said, I think it had a double meaning. It was a liberating effect for her being able to exercise a choice uh, in, in a very difficult situation. At the same time, it took her to the clinic and not to the floor. Um, but maybe, you know, and we would be ready, and I think we are already working with bank uh, colleagues to see if there are lessons learned from the way we evalu evaluate this project, which can be, you know, extrapolated and used for, for others. But I, you know, we have to be cautious because there is not one size fit, fit all in, in, in the setting. But let us, you know, share lessons learned, both success stories and, and, and failures. Failures can be as useful to share because we will, we will get some some lessons for it. So, you know, I would be, be ready to be very direct here to say that that uh, uh, that we come to the bank and, and share the experience. If we haven't done it already, we, we will look into that. Um, uh, on, on the Navy perspective here, you know, you also trigger me as a former Secretary General of the Norwegian Red Cross, where we always would be very, you know, puristic in our view about military and humanitarian aid and the need to have very separate mandates. Uh, I know how tempting it is, and you know, we see it in Afghanistan, that you have this kind of um, country X Inc. approach. It's to say that we go in and we are army, and then we bring in the NGOs and we bring in development and we put, put it all together and we win hearts and minds and, and it all ends up. Uh, uh, and the Red Cross would then say, the ICRC would say that, you know, we are neutral and we provide aid to those who are in needs and we don't distinguish between friend or foe. You need that humanitarian space and I adamantly believe that is right. And we try at least as, 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 as Norway when we are in Afghanistan with troops that we don't bring humanitarian aid as part of the, the mandate of the troops. And it's, it's, it's highly possible to separate and distinguish those mandates and carry it out which doesn't, which doesn't blur. Because once what you risk doing, this is another story, but not another issue, but what you risk doing is that if you, if you mix it and, it and the circumstances on the ground change, uh, the ones you have helped will become perhaps the minority if the power of balance changes. And, and, and the ones who then were helped will be vulnerable when the new guys come in and so on. But that being said, I remember I, I spoke about this at, at, at the British a military academy and one of them who was serving in Iraq was saying that I will not stand next to somebody suffering saying I can't help them because I, I wear a uniform. Of, of course you can't. And most of the, the, the aid organizations and humanitarian organizations had to get out of Iraq simply because it was too dangerous. So what I really believe is that our, our commanders and our officers and those who plan just have to be very aware of these issues. And it should be part of the training, knowing what obligations the Geneva Conventions put on us when we do provide aid. And, and then, of course, I think the, the Navy and the Army can be very important enabling forces to, to create the environment in which we can give aid. But I am among, I think, more on the purist side that I, I would very much caution against mixing this together. Now, um, to Judith. You know, the, 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 the project, I... I I urge you to read that Oslo Declaration. You have, well, and, and maybe also the follow-up papers. For me, that initiative was first and foremost to get colleagues engaged and have a debate and, you know, sensitize ourselves about what this would mean. What, what I now have is Bernard Kushner coming to me, to me and say, why don't you and I, Norway and France, quickly see to it that the, the hospital in Gaza is being rebuilt? Because we all see that if it isn't, uh, this is the Al-Quds Hospital, and there's the Shifa Hospital, but the Al-Quds Hospital is, has been destroyed. And if we don't, there's going to be more suffering. And, and the way we build it, rebuild it, can perhaps be a project which can bring together parties who wouldn't be brought together under other circumstances. Now, he has, of course, his background from, from Médecins Sans Frontières. I have my Red Cross background, so we are, in a way, 
uh, doing this a bit in disguise, but, but uh, uh, we have um, a greater sensitivity to those issues. Um, uh, and it's, it's a bit like the previous question. I think we have to be able to see, uh, to not, not mix it together so that we reward that side in the conflict with humanitarian help, help as part of our total, total project, but that we, as I said, try to see foreign policy also through a health, health lens. Uh, and what I'm encouraged by is that, that our experts, when they meet regularly now, start to bring these issues up in a different perspective. One example, just to mention. Uh, you know, Indonesia has been wary about sharing the virus of some of these bird viruses. Uh, and I remember last summer, uh, uh, Ambassador Holbrook wrote an article where he was very, very harsh on Indonesia, saying that this is really holding the world hostage. And I have worked a lot with my Indonesian colleague, Minister Virayuda, on this. And Norway has tried in Geneva to help and bridge those gaps. Because what he is saying is that I'm not stupid. I know that that virus has a value. It's worth something. And I know there are those who would like to get hold of it to be able to produce vaccines and then have income from that source. And I'm not against that, but I, I want a fair share. And until there is a system for doing that, we will be difficult. This, I think, and remember, 10 years ago, we had that in WHO on all these patent issues. Uh, and, and this is highly ideological and controversial. And WHO is constantly in a row with the US on this. And we had Ambassador Moose coming in, protesting and being very angry with us. But we have, WHO has to push this issue. And we have to push our, you know, uh, uh, awareness and readiness to, 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 to bridge that gap. Because it can be bridged, I believe. And I think through this initiative we have launched, it has given us access to Indonesia in a way we wouldn't have before. And perhaps then we can help in Geneva to, to find, find a solution. We might have time for another two questions. So, Jim. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Sherry. I'm the uh, uh, chairman of Global Health at George Washington University. Uh, Jonas, uh, thank you for your continued sharp uh, thinking and your uh, tenacity on these issues. Um, a, a question on, on the World Health Organization and the related organizations. Um, your continued uh, conviction on the centrality of WHO in the international um, system uh, is one I share, uh, but it's one that is not broadly shared. Um, and it's probably much less shared on this side of the Atlantic than on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, with the emergence of other entities, um, how, how would you, or what, what is your thinking about how we approach improving the governance of the international system, in particular the, the relations between these now separate giants that are moving on the international scene, whether it's a a global fund or a WHO, et cetera, and how to do that to try to have the WHO not by declaration but re-earn its, uh, its centrality in the, uh, uh, in the system. conflict where there's a lot of discussion here and in NATO and elsewhere about a way forward and it brings together the maternal and child uh, realities that you describe in very vivid form. Um, is there a health dimension to the debate about Afghanistan and where people are? Well, to, to Jim, I think, you know, the first point, which is the e easy answer, is to say that let us agree that this is an issue. And let us, let us convene in, in loose circles, you know, like this, and then bring, bring together um, the, the, the key players and, and agree why it is an issue and why we need to deal with it. There, I think, one can come some way without challenging the integrity of those who, who participate. I know that among these seven or eight or ten giants, there have been ideas of, of agreeing on, on a map, if I understand correctly. W what, what do we see and what would be the kind of division? of labor, and there are, there are some objections to that, and there are some who are in favor of it. Um, I think that the WHO's role will change for good, because it will no longer be the organization doing health at the global level. That was, in a way, 
by an explosion simply broken around 2000 and it will not come back into the old way. But I think still WHO has, and that I haven't been you know, into that for, for some years, probably fundamental strategic rethinking about how, how WHO would do its, do its work. Uh, when I was there, remember, it was, and, and Roy, you remember, it was a, a combination of being strong on standards and norms in Geneva and with the governing bodies, but also with the field activities, advice to health ministries. And the argument was that unless you are out there in the field doing all these things, you cannot play the role as a norm normative uh, organization, which is probably true. At the same time, with your experience at UNAIDS, Per perhaps UNAIDS was at its best before it got engaged in the field. I don't know. But, but you know, during, during this decade, the discussion has come, you know, uh, UNAIDS has to go into the field. There's a kind of a law of nature that that happens. But maybe WHO, I don't say this as Norwegian policy, I just say it on the basis of my own, own reflection, maybe WHO should purify that role as norm and standard setter, as the convener among those giants, to agree on broad maps of strategy, where the Gates Foundation and where the different foundations and initiatives can come in and, and agree on some of the main, 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 main avenues. Maybe something along, the, along those lines. Um, now, on Afghanistan, what you say in your question does not seem to fit with Obama's new strategy. Because here, and as I have spent time in Washington during these days to learn, uh, we are there to, to, to fight and eliminate Al-Qaeda. And then what happens in Afghanistan is a bit of a different issue. I think that this is going to be an issue. We have to discuss that because I believe that in order to succeed on the first goal, we also have to see to it that Afghanistan hangs together and that the, it has a state and, and something which, which is of meaning for its, its, its citizens. And there, there are major achievements on health in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, the number of children being immunized has gone from 10 to 80 percent. The number of children who go to a clinic and have primary health care has gone from 10 to 70, 80 percent. I went there up in the northwest Afghanistan in October, and I went to these schools, which used to be, in, be, be stables for the Taliban horses. It's now a, 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 a school for girls. So, so I believe, you know, we will have. To, we are not there with our troops to do that. But in order to pull those troops out, we have to do that because that is what is going to bring at least some stability and ownership uh, on, on, on the health side. So, but that is probably the easy part, you know, but we have to do it. The challenge here, and I say this very openly when I'm in this country, that is that uh, the US is critical of its allies of putting too many restrictions on its troops. I think that is a valid criti criti criticism. If you are the commander of troops in Afghanistan, you would like to have your troops with at, as few caveats as possible. But if you move into the civilian side in the way you give civilian aid, uh, the number of caveats and special arrangements that donors have is just making this a nightmare. 80% of money coming into Afghanistan is going outside Afghan budget. There's between a half and one billion dollars that goes unaccounted for. And I think the US for one, which is the biggest provider, no money is going through those channels. And there are good reasons, because there is corruption and there is all the rest of it, but we know from 50 years of development cooperation that if you don't do your aid by building ownership, it's a short-lived thing. So, you know, uh, we have to strengthen, and, and we go, all go to conferences and say we need more coordination, but the readiness to be coordinated as a part of that statement is very weak. So I don't know what is worst, caveats on your military troops, or these mass split in the way you give aid. I probably think the latter is the worst. Because you have 40 or 50 major donors and they all go about it their own way, splitting up national priorities. We have decided from Norwegian side that we, we give now as much aid as our military contribution costs, about $140 million. So we have $140 million worth of military we haven't defined that equation, but it's, it's, it's a reality now. And we, we have decided that 20% of our aid will go to the province where we have our troops. But 80% will then go according to Afghan and UN priorities. But if we all bring all our money to the, 
part of Afghanistan where we have our troops, there will be a huge distortion according to the needs. And everything will be more difficult. And that brought me into Afghanistan. That was not the purpose. <laughs> so I think, Mr. Minister, we could keep you here much longer having this discussion, but we can't. So um, on behalf of our guests, I want to thank you very much for sharing your experience, sharing your view of the world, um, sharing the, the, really the, the wealth and the very broad perspective that you have on these issues, and giving us a lot to think about um, in the United States, certainly, as this debate continues to move forward. So please join me in thanking the Minister for your time.